Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the first session of Learning How to Die, Socratic Discipline and the Philosophical Life, instructed by Daniel Sassilotter. Alfred North Whitehead famously claimed that the whole of Western philosophy consisted of footnotes to Plato. This seminar takes this suggestion seriously, proposing an approximation to central exemplars from Plato's dialogue to crystallize the birth of philosophical questioning across its metaphysical, epistemological, ethical, political, and aesthetic dimensions. More deeply, we will ask, what is the true meaning of the philosophical life? if the latter cannot be assimilated to a mere craft, a specialized knowledge or business, but involves something decisive and fatal in which an ultimate pronouncement of the part of human beings takes place. This is to fearlessly confront Plato's mysterious suggestion in the Phaedo, in which Socrates in his last hours defines philosophy as the art of learning how to die easily. As such, this seminar can be understood at once as an introduction to philosophy seeking to understand the vital impetus that faith faithfully orients it as a technology for dying. The seminar is organized in two parts, each organized in four weeks. The first part follows a close reading of Plato's early so-called Socratic dialogues, which recounts the last days of Socrates. This set of works encompasses the following, the following dialogues, Euthyphro, Apology, Crito, and Phaedo. As we shall see already, these sets of works unearth the most fundamental questions of philosophy in their metaphysical, epistemological, ethic, political, and aesthetic dimensions, but also in their theoretical and practical inextricability. More fundamentally, these works propose a timeless and insuperable approximation to the demands of the philosophical life, illuminating the relation between the philosopher and its interlocutors, friends, and adversaries. These dialogues thereby interrogate the pedagog pedagogical and practical responsibility of philosophy to the city, in which the rapport between civil society and the state, the philosophical teacher and the youth, becomes key to decoding the crucial distinction between wisdom and knowledge, and finally between philosophy and the sophists or men of the courts. The second part propose, uh, proposes to follow key texts from Plato's middle dialogues, focusing on the central arc in which the tension between sophistry and philosophy approximates the possibility of a dialectical resolution between broadly Heraclitian and Parmenidian orientations of thought. These works encompass the following dialogues, Cratylus, Theetetus, Sophist, and Parmenides. Following this trajectory, we explore the consolidation of different methodological levers that philosophy assimilates and perennial problems that it confronts in order to distinguish its own activity as much as its proper subject matter, the articulation between uh, being and becoming, the, di di the dialectical tension between that which is and that which is not, and between the one and the many, the analytic procedure of the method of division in which the separation of philosophy from sophistry becomes crystallized, the war between names, revealed in etymological investigation between naturalist and relativist, the problematic articulation between perception and knowledge, and with it the embryonic distinction between empiricist and rationalist theories of knowledge. Daniel Sassilotto is a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, Los Angeles. His research focuses on the field of contemporary philosophy and Latin American literature. In particular, his research focuses on the reconciliation of rationalism and materialism and the method methodological relation between epistemology and ontology in contemporary philosophy. He is currently finishing a full length monograph tentatively titled Saving the Numenon, an essay on the foundations of ontology in which he proposes, he proposes a critical reading of, uh, of the ontological turn in contemporary philosophy and lays the foundations for a new transcendental epistemology, chiefly inspired in the works of Wilfred Sellars, Robert Brandom, Alain Badio, Lawrence Puntel, Ray Brassier, Reza Nagarstani, and Jay Rosenberg. So now I pass the mic to Daniel to start the seminar. Thank you very much, Atafi. And welcome everybody. I'm Daniel, obviously. Um, nice to see some familiar faces and many new ones as well. So um, before we get to anything substantive and even logistical, Usually the way this goes is, uh, you know, just a round of introductions as usual. So what I 
the way we do this normally is just essentially to go uh, person by person and you know how this works essentially you you say who you are what i wanted to know though uh please do make sure to say what philosophical training you've had in the past um, so that i have an idea of what's the level of philosophical training that people have in this seminar um and so i can be properly pedagogical let's put it that way um so i'm going to go just looking at the class roster by uh my name um uh, alberto jesus ponce catalan can you start yes Hello, everyone, and hello, Daniel. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is uh, Alberto Ponce. I'm a Chilean writer and researcher. I'm here in, I'm, I'm living in Santiago de Chile. And my background is in philosophy. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a kind of weird because I don't have a background in Eastern philosophy, more in Western philosophy, because I'm a really, um, Western is Oriental. No. East. East, east is oriente oriente is east no i don't know how to say in in, in english chinese chinese philosophy is east no. oh, sorry east. chinese east. Okay. east yeah okay now your approximation to philosophy is eastern philosophy not west philosophy so i never uh, read something uh, with plate on something like that. It's only like Confucius and uh, Lao Tzu things. So it's my first time uh, to deep in Western philosophy. So I'm so excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that should prove uh, interesting to have that perspective in class. Um, then we have Sean Francis Han. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'm Sean. Um, nice to meet everybody. Um, yeah, I'm from uh, Singapore. I just finished my master's in literature and critical theory at the National University of Singapore. Um, I'm primarily interested in uh, contemporary French theory, uh, specifically focusing on Deleuze, Badiou, and Larel, um, especially interested in uh, metaphysics and meta philosophy, so things like speculative realism and new materialisms and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, philosophical training wise, I mean, the, the most of it I got was in the continental tradition that was during my uh, MA, but then I've also, because, you know, my interest and in my research is primarily on Deleuze, um, I've, I've had to go into, you know, the early moderns and the medievals in my own time, um, and Plato as, as well, yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And I've been also myself, I'm, I'm in an incurable Deleuzian binge for the last couple of years. I can't oh, get into the guy. So oh, yeah. that's been me the last seven years. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of fun to be had there for sure. Uh, afterward, uh, wax and lyrical. <laughs> that's true. Then we have uh, Aaron, Aaron Marcus. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron. Um, I'm from Argentina. I'm from my philosophical background is more self-taught. I guess my background is more intellectual history and German. Um, and I've kind of come at this largely through kind of new center, neo-Hegelianism, I don't know, Daniel and that has taken classes before, so I guess. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm newer to Plato. I only really um, first read any Plato seriously about two years ago. Uh, and, and it's been a big uh, revelation to me, the value of this book. Thank you, thank you. And yes, it is when you find, I'm, we're gonna talk about reading Plato in a little bit, but um, it is a revelation when people come to it after having read other, other stuff, certainly. Um, after uh, we have Rachel Klipa, and please correct me if I mispronounce any of your names. Um, my name is Rachel Klipa. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm an arts administrator at the Office for Public Art, and I am in the art and curatorial program here at the New Center. I don't have any former, former, or excuse me, formal philosophical training. This is my third session through the New Center, so I've learned a lot, but I don't have any background before this. So, thank you. Welcome. After we have. Um... Enrique Darlim. Hello, guys. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Enrique. I am a history teacher. And my, my only uh, 
my my background in philosophy comes mostly from my degree in history, but also from other uh, other readings I did, uh, self taught. Uh, so I, I read some Foucault, some Nietzsche, some Marx, uh, the the most uh, well known authors, right? But it's not so formal. I, I don't have like a, a a deep understanding of things like uh, what is ontology, what are, what are the things, uh, what are the concepts used inside metaphysics and things like this. But that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you and welcome. Um, we have Ramona Singh. Hi, uh, Ramona, that's fine. Um, I, uh, I'm in New York right now. Um, I'm currently doing my master's in philosophy. Um, I'm actually more interested in comparative literature, uh, Caribbean and Latin American literature. Um, I have avoided Plato for a very long time when I started uh, getting my BA and now getting my MA. And recently I got into Plato and was, wow, this is actually really cool. I'm not boring at all as I thought, um, but that's pretty much it. Cool. And I have a very similar trajectory there where I began as a philosophy student. I went to comparative literature, but always kept my heart also close to philosophy and do mostly philosophy. This is interesting, welcome. And sorry, uh, Ramona, you pronounce your name Ramona or Ramona? Uh, just Ramona. Ramona, okay, thank you. After we have Alexandra Esmorodinova. Um, yeah, hello. Um, my name is Alexandra. I think I don't have a, like, a philosophical background because I'm architect and have masters in urban planning, but uh, I read a lot of philosophy uh, connected with uh, urban theory um, and um, some philosophers who write about architecture, like Foucault, about borders, like uh, Guattari, and so on. So um, I like to read philosophical texts in my free time, uh, but it's not a uh, really professional background. Great, thank you. Um, you know, something interesting, um, I presume you know Louis Kahn. He was actually very much influenced by Plato, and in many of his essays, he writes as a Platonist, actually. So he has a Platonist take on architecture that I recommend that you take a look at if you haven't. It's very, very, very cool. Uh, welcome. Next, we have Raviv Sark. Hey, my name's Raviv. I am um, based in New York right now. I, uh, my formal training is um, in pure math and physics. I have a degree in both of those BS. And um, I kind of came to philosophy also as an autodidact. Um, I was interested uh, in Deleuze also as an undergrad and I did, I spent a year working on an independent reading thing doing that. And uh, I also read some like Spinoza for that. And more recently I've been interested in uh, German idealism and um, also the interface between those subjects and philosophy of mathematics, because I feel like that's something I have more of a wheelhouse in. So, yeah. Excellent, welcome. And um, those will be all referenced that we're gonna be going back to consistently throughout the seminar as well. So, great. Um, after we have uh, Lika Kareva. Hello everyone, um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, my research path is uh, kind of uh, convoluted, I guess. <laughs> um, I would mention the first thing, uh, the first big thing where I was involved, which is the cyber feminist collective from Moscow and St. Petersburg. I'm from Russia. I live in Moscow, but uh, I was involved in it for many years. And so we had a, a teacher, an esoteric teacher, a leader of our collective, uh, uh, who is a feminist uh, philosopher. Uh, so um, we um, practiced philosophy in a way that uh, she guided us and our main philosophical enemies were always, uh, as, as in all feminist philosophy, Descartes, uh, Kant and Plato. <laughs> 
uh, but but uh, yeah, because uh, you take uh, every feminist philosophy uh, text uh, from the 70s uh, and it uh, would start by attacking De Descartes or by uh, attacking uh, uh, attacking Plato because they are very influenced by Derrida. But okay, uh, then I got out of this uh, collective, uh, luckily, <laughs> and started to read all those uh, bands, all those uh, bad men. <laughs> and yes, what is interesting that I've read uh, almost uh, all uh, complete works of Plato, almost everything, but I've read it in Russian. And in Russian, we for instance, as I mentioned uh, in Discord, we do not have uh, an allegory of the cave because we have a myth of the cave instead of it. And yes, that, that uh, must be interesting to now to compare the English Republic to the Soviet ones. Thank you, that's very interesting. And incidentally, I was just looking at your um essay on Minecraft yesterday, which was very interesting. Very cool. Um, after uh, we have Anchao uh, Saxena, Saxena, how do you pronounce that? You will help me with it's, that one. It's uh, Saxena, but Anchao is fine. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Anchao. I'm in Mumbai right now. Um, yeah, it's pretty late. I, I mean, it was it's past my bedtime. <laughs> and I put it in an alarm to wake up to attend the session, but I'm happy to be here. Um, I trained as an architect and I've been working in contemporary art, so I don't really have a formal education in uh, philosophy. I've, I've maintained, a, I would say, like a lukewarm interest in Freud and Jung and, you know, like red pieces by them here and there every now and then, but yeah, um, uh, no formal education, but I'm excited to, to learn more. Excellent, thank you. And respect for being awake late. <laughs> well, you won't fall asleep. <laughs> after we have, after we have a uh, Will Frazier. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, I'm in Minnesota. Um, and I guess my, I'm first and foremost a musician. I studied art history and music at school. And then I kind of, uh, by way of critical theory and kind of, uh, I guess, kind of the fallout from the speculative realism moment kind of inspired me in, in no small part towards kind of pursuing philosophy on my own. Um, and then for the past six or eight months or so, I've been a student here at the New Center. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm interested in, just become very interested in like big systematic questions about the genesis of the transcendental, transcendental invariance. And I've not read a lot of Plato. Actually, the, uh, we were required to read The Republic my freshman year of undergrad. Uh, and so back when I was, a, as Reza would say, baby in my cradle or whatever. So it's, it's been kind of funny to revisit this. Um, text again uh and i'm super stoked to be taking a dive into plato so well, well thank you and good to see you will uh then we have emil will vilmar or wilmar michael hi i'm emil um yeah beautiful pronunciation um i'm from new zealand sorry it's an early morning for me <laughs> um and i'm feeling a bit dusty but um yeah, I, no, no formal philosophical background um, apart from sort of what you get at art school, general. Because yeah, you, I'm not going to say anymore. Um, it's just big Purdue guy, love Purdue. So it's really nice sort of read it down doing the readings earlier today or later last night. Um, coming home and being like, hey, right, so it's nice of reading this <laughs> from Purdue. I hate to say it, I feel guilty saying it, but I. I um, no, I found the allegory of the cave much better. He's right. The Jew's right. There's a bunch of yes men with Plato. So, 
I'm sort of a Plato <laughs> hater, but not really. Yeah. I like Plato. Anyway, that's enough for me. But he's right. And Amantha was a was a good addition there. Um, welcome, Emil. After we have uh, Enda with Jordan. Yeah, it's just so weird and there's, there's no um no thrills. Hey, um yeah, I'm I'm from Ireland. I live in Berlin at the moment. I've been in a few of your classes now. Um I have a background in philosophy. I have the same kind of um like joker origin story of like doing an undergraduate in philosophy and then going to do something else and now coming back to do philosophy. So yeah, um <clears throat> I think what I'm really interested in at the moment is um a weird mix of formal logic and Adorno. I don't know why. Um, I don't know how I've been led onto that path, probably just like trying to merge uh, distinct interests. But um, yeah, I'm also really excited to learn about how to die. Um, so yeah, and I'll just be like off camera a little bit longer and then I'll, I'll, I'll join in earnest. I'm listening very intently. Cool. It's actually refreshing to see you end up without a black, creepy background, you know, in the, in the shadows. You finally, oh, you finally I'll rectify escaped. that shortly. <laughs> uh, you'll finally, you finally escape the cave. It seems. Yeah. Um, after we have Richard Hames. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name's Richard. Obviously, uh, what to say? Uh, in like a, a past life, I did something terrible, I guess, and um, so I'm British, and I my training in philosophy is that I. Um, I did a music undergraduate composition. Uh, so I uh, at a, an extremely traditional music school. And so I spent um, a, a lot of time kind of reading Adorno uh, by myself and uh, feeling like it gave me uh, a kind of power over uh, music that other people uh, lacked or something. And this was a mistake. Um, and then I uh, started reading Deleuze instead and decided that there was no way of deciding between uh, Adorno and Deleuze and that I would kind of just have to persist in in thinking they were both right about everything and then um, I guess I kind of abandoned um, well not the hatred of jazz stuff I, I, and I just yeah uh, um, yeah the uh, um, what else I, I guess like uh, I'm now thinking about uh, my, yeah my kind of philosophy training is like little bits and pieces when it's relevant to the problem at hand which has been like climate change politics um, fascism, uh, writing music, um, thinking about like alternative forms of modernization, uh, like thinking about computers in some sense. And now the thing I'm thinking about is the end of the world um, and thinking about whether or not there's a kind of philosophical framework for that or whether or not the end of the world is something that atrophies the notion of a framework uh, entirely. So th that is, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, I've also been teaching this, this class at uh, CalArts about eschatological narratives and the concept of the end of the world, actually. Lately. So it's, uh, it's another thing that I'm also quite interested in. But welcome. Uh, after we have Eduardo Camargo. Hi, everyone. My name is Eduardo. Um, I'm currently based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, making a master's on artistic practice where I'm researching um, trying to arrive at a systematic comprehension of memes as cultural units. Um, and I haven't had uh, haven't had before formal education in philosophy directly, but um, I had like mostly through aesthetics, uh, structuralism and, and some things close to this. And uh, right now we've been also in, in at CPC, Circuito de Pesquisas Cibernéticas, which is a group of the Brazilians, which are something around the new center. Like uh, we have people like Zenobio, um, Rafael, Mateus, Caromo. We've been reading a lot of value form theory, which have been very interesting in the relations of like um, mental and uh, concrete entities. How can we define materialism? How can we define idealism? Do we use these terms or not? Or if they are confusing? Uh, Leek is also there at CPC with us. And uh, this has been like my, my interest to get like a, a good understanding of how we can understand the relations between mental and concrete entities, whatever this means. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, we, we will actually be very briefly touching upon that question today a little bit later on. Uh, but welcome. 
Uh, finally, we have Yana Tomichi. Uh, yes, let me just turn on my video real quick and get my shit together. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, and everybody else, I'm uh, Joanna. Uh, I'm currently based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, uh, originally from Romania. Um, my background is in some pretty old school, like media art kind of stuff. Um, so I want to say that I am kind of like familiar with media theory from the angle of like Matthew Fuller and some post CCRU kind of stuff. Um, but I'm super happy to be here and kind of like dive deeper into the basics of um, some uh, platonic theory and allegories of the cave are more than welcome. Um, and I want to say also that I'm a bit of a novice in terms of like the Lozenatorian theory, um, a bit of like uh, contemporary philosophy such as Reza, also Amy Ireland and uh, some other people. Um, yeah, sorry, I think that's it. Cool, Thanks. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think I got everybody. That's that's everybody. Uh, people have been joining and leaving. So if I miss anybody, just put one of those yellow little hands uh, in, in the panel and I, I should be able to see it so that I can see if anybody's missing. Uh, but I think that's everybody. Oh, there's someone in the attendee. Um, Kemal Tezgin has uh, his or her or their hands up. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, my uh, camera doesn't work. I don't know why. Uh, I'm Kamal, and uh, it's actually my first time as a LEAF seminar in the new center. Uh, I, I'm a physicist and uh, I do my postdoc now um, in New York and uh, I have an MA in philosophy and my interest is in the continental philosophy. I especially do um, did research on Deleuze mostly uh, and yeah I, I haven't read much about Plato and I'm really interested to delve more into it. Uh, yeah that's all. Excellent. Uh, I'm not going to ask the people in the attendee section to, to introduce themselves since many of them are in anonymous uh, covers. But uh, if anybody wants to introduce themselves, of course, they're more than welcome to as well. Um, but with that said, um, so, okay, welcome everybody. My name is Daniel, Daniel Sassolato. Um, I am actually a comparative literature PhD by training, but my the focus of my research is in contemporary philosophy. Um, as the very outdated <laughs> biography says, um, I'm in the process of publishing a book, which is going to finally come out, uh, finally. Um, I actually heard finally that it's now going to be under contract, so I'm very happy about that. But um, my journey to philosophy was first as a philosophy BA. Uh, I went to uh, analytic school in Cornell University where I actually studied under Gail Fine, who is one of the most prominent uh, scholars of Plato in the analytic academy, at least. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, there is a overarching distinction, disciplinary distinction between continental and analytic philosophy, where analytic philosophy roughly corresponds to the tradition of philosophy that emerges in the early 20th, well, since the late 19th, early 20th century in the Anglo-Saxon world, but it's a complicated division. In any case, I was uh, sort of, I had the, the, the pleasure and the, and the privilege to, to work under Gail Fine for my thesis when I was an, uh, a BA student. And I became very much uh, attracted to Plato even back then, even though I was in no position to understand him. And yet there I was, of course, writing a thesis on Heidegger and Husserl and phenomenology and everything else, right? Um, but I think one of the things that, that, that has struck me is that I've been, both forced and predisposed to return to Plato at different points in my life and throughout my philosophical journey, if you want to use a corny word. And every time that even revisiting texts that I was familiar with, my experience and my comprehension has completely transformed not only my appreciation of Plato, but my understanding of philosophy as a whole. Um, Plato, if anything, is one of those 
perennial authors that you have to keep just going back to time and time and time again. And similar, you know, people say, you know, oh, you have to read Don Quixote, you know, when you're young, when you're middle in life, and then late in life. Well, played is the same way, right? You just got to keep reading him time and time again. Um, and what we will be doing today, um, after I'm done introducing like high latitude stuff, is essentially going through an introduction to Plato that takes a different angle, rather than a sort of historiographical angle that tries to, you know, tell you about Plato the man, Plato the writer, Plato blah, blah, blah. What I want to do is more of a philosophical introduction to Plato. Everybody can go and read about Plato's, you know, quote unquote biography <laughs> uh, online. I don't need to bore you with that. What I want to do is actually try to weave Plato into the history of philosophy, sort of like a kind of elevator pitch to Platonism before we descend and start talking about Plato himself and Plato you know, in, in, in the original sort of writings. A uh, few words of caution. Um, so I am not a specialist on Plato in the sense that, you know, someone like Gail Fine would be. But I work through Plato and with Plato, and I will begin by actually talking a little bit about what was it that drew me to Plato and to return to Plato at this particular moment in my life, and what I think Plato, uh, why Plato is of essential importance today, not just for philosophy, but in a certain sense, more broadly still there's something or a, a fundamental decision which is where i will begin talk uh, concerning plato but before that i i need to say um before i lose anybody <laughs> that there is going to be a um, um a logistical detail change which is that for reasons of travel i'm not going to be here during the scheduled third week so weeks three and four are going to be moved essentially one week later, right? So everything's just gonna take place, you know? Uh, so week three is gonna be where week four was, and then there's gonna be one week after that. So just if you allow me very quickly, week three is the week, uh, it's uh, Friday the 29th. That session will not be taking place. So we will be resuming, week three will be taking place on August the 5th. And then the last session, session four, will take place on August the 12th. You'll all be receiving an email concerning this in the future, but I'm just letting this everybody know already, just in case there's gonna be some problems with the scheduling and so on, all right? So that's that should be that. Um, the next thing I want to say is, I want to say something about um, what the concept of the seminar is. Of course, the title is Learning How to Die, uh, Socratic Discipline and the Philosophical Life, a very, a very uh, you know, melodramatic title, one would say. Um, but it, 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 it occurred to me that um, it was a moment in which I was going through a kind of existential crisis. And I suppose as, as a philosopher or as an aspiring philosopher, whatever you want me to say, um, I wanted to see what philosophy could do for me in that in that situation, right? Um, to look at philosophy not only as a quote unquote, quote unquote theoretical enterprise hanging from you know from above, but whether philosophy offered me any tools not for consolation but any sort of um, you know direction as to how I should assimilate this. And I decided to go back to Plato, and I I, I made it I made it a point to myself. I said, well, how about you go and you read Plato from beginning to end. You know, you have all of his works here. Let's try that. Let's see how that goes. And I did. It took a year roughly, but I, I read the whole of Plato, uh, which I had never done. I mean, there were many, many dialogues that I had never read before. And I was flabbergasted. And I think the, the first thing that, that struck me is that beyond, you know, there's, there are huge scholastic debates concerning how we should organize, uh, and to just ask, what's your favorite dialogue? The Phaedo. <laughs> the Phaedo is just simply insuperable for me. It's, there's just everything. And, and I'm going to say something about this right now, which is the first thing that struck me is that there are all these scholastic debates about how we should read Plato, how we should chronologically organize Plato's dialogues and works more generally, the apocryphal Plato versus the bona fide canonical Plato, and so on and so on. And what struck me is perhaps, again, this is a symptom of this stage in my reading, was that I noticed there was something like a systematic coherence to Plato. 
that I hadn't seen before, first of all, because I was in no position to really think about Plato as a whole, but only scattered dialogues. And I think that's something interesting. Of course, we are not here in this seminar in a position where we can read all of Plato or exhaustively uh, take a survey class on Plato. That's not gonna happen, right? What I have done is rather try to focus on two sets of dialogues that I think are going to give you a sense of the systematic integrity of Plato's works. The first being the Socratic dialogues that encompass what is called or referred to in the literature as the last days of Socrates. Of course, those are the dialogues that are in the syllabus for this uh, first part of this conceived two-part seminar. Hopefully the second part will come at some point. And the second ones are a series of dialogues, oftentimes considered late middle or late dialogues. Again, there's debates concerning chronology and that are usually considered to be quote unquote, fundamental dialogues in the sense that they deal with the life of a younger Socrates trying to define the basic tenets of metaphysics, epistemology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those are notoriously difficult. But one thing that came also to mind when I was reading um, Plato from beginning to end was the utter incomprehensibility of the last days of Socrates and these sometimes called early dialogues without having read more expansively uh, Plato's corpus. Uh, strangely enough, because it is often said, and this is one of the exegetical debates that is had in the literature on Plato, that Plato, you know, essentially in the early dialogues is close or simply parroting back um, Socrates' own views about everything, you know, about metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics. But as he moves, as, as we move into the middle dialogues, Plato begins to develop a kind of view of his own, uh, uh, you know, starts to diverge from the master. And then finally, in the late dialogues, we see Plato essentially have the, you know, develop his own complete independence from Socrates. Not complete, right? But essentially to, to have attained a kind of autonomy. Well, Perhaps this is my naivete and perhaps I'm not a sufficiently subtle reader, but one of the things that I have to say is that I do not see this divergence as strongly as most commentators do. The literature on Plato, the secondary literature on Plato, is of course marked very much by this institutional divide that I mentioned earlier on. Philosophy has, of course, an analytic tradition, a continental tradition, and the way that these traditions deal with Plato reflects very much the quote unquote methodological presuppositions of the respective traditions, the emphases that you are that you come to expect. So that if you see Plato as read by someone like Badu, of course you're going to see Plato, there's a fly here, sorry. Uh, Plato, the systematic you know, uh, thinker, the proto-communist uh, universalist. Whereas if you read someone like Gail Fine, the advisor that I had, right? Um, you're going to see essentially what everybody tries to do in the analytic tradition, which is to transform Plato into a kind of lucid Aristotelian, you know, and, you know, someone who anticipated Aristotle, Plato who doesn't believe in two world metaphysics, but who is a naturalist really at heart in some way, a gadfly, a gadfly, <laughs> there we go. Um, so that's, that's one thing, right? So I'm also, this is not a class where we're going to be spending ample time discussing the different quote unquote exegetical interpretations of Plato. Um, and I also, I don't speak ancient Greek or I, you know, so I, I'm not capable of reading these texts in the original. If any of you can read ancient Greek and has the capacity to read these, that would be lovely, but I don't think so. Uh, so, in, so we're gonna have to make do with our preferred languages. A brief note on translations. For reasons of consistency, I have included the Plato's Collected Work Collection, which is rather remarkably well curated. Um, generally, the translations are of a very high standard. They're not always the best translations that are out there, but it has the benefit of having consistency terminologically and being very clean and polished. So we're gonna be using that. I also uploaded the group translation uh, of uh, Republic uh, independently into the into the OneDrive folder, since that is considered to be you know sort of the standard. Um, but in general, we're going to be using this big bulky collection. However, 
if you have your own preferences or you have access to, you know, uh, in print to different translations, you're more than welcome to use those as your primary reference. And uh, it would be actually very interesting to hear, you know, how some of these translations diverge. I can't say that I've read all of Plato in all different translations that exist. Uh, that, that's not where I am at either. But I have, I have some familiarity with uh, some of the divergent translations. And it turns out, of course, as predictably, as we already heard uh, from Lika concerning the concept of uh, you know, the, the allegory of the cave versus the myth of the cave. I don't know if that's a translational difference exactly, but several terms, the way that they are translated carry uh, not just stylistic consequences, but semant profound semantic consequences and therefore substantive uh, sort of divergences in how we read Plato. Philosopher King versus Guardian, you know, that doesn't really ring the same kinds of bells, doesn't it? Um, so that's another thing. Another thing, uh, perhaps going even more pathetic at this point, uh, is that I wanted to just say something concerning what is the, folk, the thematic focus across these two uh, chunks of the seminar. The first is that um, the title, Learning How to Die, is an expression actually that, you, that is used by Socrates in the Phaedo which is going to be the final, the last dialogue that we read for this particular uh, module for the first part, part of the class, where it is actually proposed as a definition of philosophy, right? I'm not gonna repeat everything that was already mentioned in the introduction in the, in the course description, but essentially this was very, this was quite interesting because it essentially defines philosophy this time, not as a theor primarily a theoretical enterprise that's concerned with questions of knowledge or being or metaphysics or something like that, but as something like a preparation for death, right? And as we all know, um, the way that this is, well, no, maybe that's not what we all know, but one thing that we should say is that the way that this has usually been read in the history of philosophy, um, until quite recently, in fact, is that this is essentially the theistic dimension of Plato. The Plato who endorses the immortality of the soul in continuity with the Pythagorean thesis, the Plato who believes that the job of philosophy is something like you know, to prepare us for judgment day, <laughs> right? A, a very Christianized, of course, reading of Plato, very much mediated by our understanding of sin, redemption, you know, uh, life as essentially atonement or something of the sort. But it really has to do with a concept that I'm going to be leaning very heavily on because I think this concept is a concept that has been underappreciated in its role systematically applying Plato's work, which is the concept of catharsis. Now, the concept of catharsis is a concept that comes from the Pythagorean tradition, and it is a concept that is used by Plato to refer to the process of the purification of the soul in relationship to the body. And this process of purification of the soul, this is going to be perhaps the central thesis of the seminar, is something that allows us to understand the systematic integrity between the ontological, epistemological, ethical, and political dimensions of Plato's thought. I might want to venture further and say, as uh, the description indicates, that this also encompasses the aesthetic dimension. And indeed, there is something to be said about how it is that the, that the eon in particular which is where uh, Socrates famously engages in this kind of uh, highly, highly sort of ironic dialogue with Eon, the rhapsode, the rhapsodes being the, um, the ones who, who were the great reciters and interpreters of poetry, right? Um, and there's a, there's a hierarchy there that also mirrors the other hierarchies, I think, to, to some extent, but I haven't completed that. So catharsis, the process of purification of the soul, we're going to see corresponds theoretically to a vector of ontological, to, to an ontological hierarchy, which establishes the different degrees of reality or the different ontological kinds that there exist in the world, the different kinds of things, but also an epistemological hierarchy that establishes, of course, the different kinds of knowledge or the different kinds of cognitive attitude, if you will, that we have in relationship to the entities that are described by this ontological hierarchy. And this process of purification is also corresponding to a pedagogical program that progressively prepares the individual of the city, the citizen, to become the guardian, the philosopher. 
So the question that's going to be also at the center is, well, what the hell is philosophy then? Because one thing, and I suppose we are all, we all understand this, right? But, but it needs to be said. And it's amazing how stupid people can be when they read Plato very, very quickly, um, because we all understand that what philosophy meant back then is not exactly the same as today, right? Today, philosophy is an academic discipline that is you know, disciplinarily isolated or considered to be separated from other fields like the natural sciences, the social sciences, psychology, whatever you want, right? But back then it wasn't the case, right? Philosophy encompassed a pursuit of wisdom that within itself included scientific investigation, mathematics, political training, training about warfare and so on and so forth, astronomy, geometry, you name it, right? Philosophy had a much more comprehensive sense. Philosophy was more than just a disciplinary occupation. It was something like the very preparation to understand knowledge holistically. That's another thing that I'm going to be leaning very heavily upon. In this systematic integrity that I'm going to be tracing in Plato, I will also be speaking quite strongly about Plato as an of the, un, the Socratic understanding of philosophy as implying a kind of holism. Holism that, again, encompasses all these different philosophical dimensions or aspects, the dimensions of metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics. So with that in mind, that's, that's very high latitude. Um, I'm just like introducing some of the, 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 the concepts. Um, when I was reading the Phaedo, when I encountered this expression of learning how to die, I was taken back to something which was my own philosophical awakening. And I was trying to think, when was it really that I started to think about this, about philosophy, even if I hadn't read anything? And I was going back and I had, um, I have a, a short autobiographical story, um, sort of following from this beautiful text of, of Badiou, which is called Philosophy as Biography, uh, where he talks about how it is the different experiences in his life led to the formation of character that eventually would make him a philosopher. But in my case, I have a very, very, very uh, tender memory. I hope you'll indulge me for one second with this. But it is when I was about four years old and I was uh, in Peru where I'm from incidentally. Um, and I was inconsolable in bed. I broke down in tears because for the first time in my life I had realized I was going to die. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I'm going to die. You know, one day I'm going to die. And I started crying inconsolably. My grandmother, who raised me, and uh, came into the room and she saw me crying and she sat in the bed and asked me, what is going on? Well, what's wrong, uh, hijito? Right? And I said, grandma, I'm going to die. I'm going to die one day. And what you would expect is my grandma was a very religious woman, Catholic woman. Um, what you would expect for, from a grandmother, a Catholic grandmother to her four-year-old grandson would be a measure of consolation, right? Would be like, well, you know, you're going to die, yes, but if you behave well, you'll, you'll meet me because <laughs> I'm going to die before. Um, well, you'll meet all your loved ones and everybody else in the afterlife, you know, and you'll be happy forevermore in paradise. Right? That's what you would expect, at least at that level. But my grandmother was very, 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 um, I don't know what the right word is, okay? But she said something, she went on a different route. She told me, well, yes, you're going to die. And think about this. What were you before you were born? And I said, nothing. Well, that is what you will be after you die. Nothing. Now, that could, you know, I presume, uh, send someone into a existential, you know, just, that could have made it worse, right? But actually, that blew my mind. Because something happened at that moment. I remember that that idea itself allowed me to do something quite different, which was all of a sudden... I was so fascinated by the very idea that from nothing we came to nothing we go, that I will be nothing, that all of a sudden it was no longer a question about my specific death. It was no longer a personal question. All of a sudden, the question became a general question, a universal question, the question of death, the passage from being to nothing. Of course, not in those terms, I was four. But all of a sudden, this fear and this complete 
sort of overwhelming sense of sort of vertigo of falling into a void became overtaken by a kind of curiosity, a kind of drive towards understanding this much more mysterious dynamic. And I think there's something to that that is almost, I mean, this, this very cute, very, very, you know, um, pure kind of story about a child and his grandmother lies something fundamental about philosophy and the philosophical life, which is a concept that I want to really uh, explore as well. Badiou makes this point rather beautifully. Philosophy concerns showing us that the interests, the distractions, the questions, the preoccupations, the anxieties, the desires that we live through in the everyday world are fleeting, that higher seductions and higher questions exist. And that these higher questions are capable of allowing us to overcome this kind of existential dread in a particular way. Now, of course, immediately all the red flags come in and say, isn't this just the feeble consolation of the idiot, of the theist, of the believer? And in that dialectic between those who accept the verdict that through philosophy, one can access something like a higher uh, sort of domain of knowledge or comprehension that in some way allows us to exceed the finitude and the contingencies of everyday life versus those who think that this is a fool's errand, a consolation at best, and a very destructive one at worst, organizes the history of Plato's reception and how Plato is assimilated. So I don't want to speak about Plato primarily as a footnote, as a author for a disciplinary discourse, call it philosophy, that is isolated from everything else. I want to really try to speak about what kind of life the philosopher is enjoining us to partake in. What is the philosophical life? What is philosophy ultimately understood as? What does it require from us if we were to become philosophers, right? Lofty question it is. We will see this is not something that's a menial task, something that can be answered very easily. So with that in mind, um, what I wanna to do today, um, I have a gazillion things to, 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 to talk about, but I want to begin by uh, entering the conversation with a brief exposition that prepared through a PowerPoint as usual. I work with PowerPoint. Um, and what I will usually do is stop periodically for discussion. One thing is everybody is more than welcome to jump at any point in time. Um, since I will be you know, consulting through a PowerPoint, it's always helpful if you wanna jump in to just jump in directly, I don't mind at all and interrupt me at any point. Or to, if you prefer, give your hand up. I will also be consulting the chat periodically to make sure that uh, nothing, you know, no questions are, uh, you know, left hanging. But because these chat rooms tend to get rather wild, uh, I might not be able to, you know, browse through six pages of backs and forths about, uh, you know, everything. So please bear that in mind. And if there's something you really want to say, um, hands up, go in. At the end, of, uh, at the tail end of the class, I will return to logistics and just speak about very briefly about what's required of the class. Okay, um, but with that with that in mind, um, I'm going to get started with with the concrete stuff. Um, New Center just said regarding translation. Recently, I was looking for a consistent translation to use as a reference and end up using Plato in twelve volumes, mainly Lance and Fowler's trans translations. Would be nice to know your idea on that one. That's like I mean both. Uh, uh, Lamb and Fowler's translations are excellent, uh, and you can absolutely use that. Um, that that's 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 completely uh, um, now. There there are there there are you know places where I prefer other translations, but it's essentially you know a more than credible one. There's a very high standard of translation at this point. You you'll you'll ha you'll have to go very far or dig very cheap into some of these like old editions to, to get bad translations at this point. So we're pretty much on the cliff, but stylistically um, there's divergence. Okay, any questions or any thoughts or any comments anybody wants to uh, throw in before we get started with, uh, with the stuff? No? Excellent. So let me, give me one tiny second. So this first introductory session um, is called the Friends of 
and enemies of Plato. And what I will be doing essentially is, first of all, trying to bring the problematic of Platonism into the fore, the central questions, the central problems that we will be looking at. Sorry. And secondly, I will be engaging in a short recapitulation, uh, what I will call a brief history of Platonism, where I go through essentially a couple of essential points, but focusing mostly on the enemies, the assault and the rehabilitation of Platonism that took place between the 19th and the 21st centuries. This very interesting arc, which I, I presume is going to be more familiar to uh, most of us who have read things like Nietzsche or those of us who are engaged through the New Center or otherwise with people like Ressa and other Platonists today working uh, in, in this tradition. Badiou, of course, is another one. So the first thing to be said is how I came to Plato in this, in this juncture in, in, in my life. And as I mentioned, um, those of you who have taken seminars with me or have you know, been familiar with some of my work will know that throughout the last several years, I've been very much exploring this tensional relationship between Platonism and naturalism, um, essentially because I've been very much interested in the assimilation of structuralist methodologies in philosophy both in the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of science and ontology, and how it is that different forms of mathematical Platonism uh, have emerged in the last uh, you know, 50 years or so as a kind of pursuit for a new kind of materialist thinking. Plato has been now rehabilitated in the name of a kind of new materialism or realism. Um, now, these terms are all technical terms, and I will be making them more precise as we go along. But essentially, this was something quite interested me, that quite interesting, because, of course, it has been, you know, always it, traditionally uh, a common practice to read in Plato a kind of precursor to the modern rationalists' uh, school of thought. Plato is the great rationalist. And rationalism essentially means that there is a kind of knowledge that is primary, that is not sensory in nature, that is not derived from sensory experience, right? Uh, and of course, Plato is considered to be a rationalist in this sense, in this epistemological sense, in contrast to Aristotle, who thinks not only that the mark of being is substance, concrete particulars, things in the world, primary substances, but the knowledge derives from knowledge of precisely these substances. This is perfectly kosher, let's say, within the horizon of what Plato has been read as. What is weird is to read Plato as a materialist, <laughs> right? Or as at the very least hiding or, 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 or harboring the kernel necessary for materialism. Because Plato has traditionally been conceived precisely as the guy who claims that there are these things called ideas or forms that exist in independence of physical, material, sensible bodies, right? That there's a kind of two world metaphysics in Plato, or at the very least, you know, if not an idealism, a, a dualism, a two world dualism of soma and eidos, in which we see a difference between sensible particulars and these forms, which are abstract entities, abstract universals. So speaking of Plato as a materialist seems very, very, very interesting. And the reason we're going to see this later on that people think that Plato in fact must be read along these lines and why it is that Plato holds the key to a reconstituted materialism and not dualism or idealism is of, because of the role of course that mathematics plays in explaining the relationship between Soma and Eidos and how it is that mathematics explains the nature of the forms or ideas themselves but more on that in a little bit. More deeply, however, so this is just my sort of like introduction to these questions, the, the, you know, the urgency that methodologically brings me to Plato, but there is something very important that's going on with the name Plato, precisely not only because of this constellation, but there's a very, very old uh, trial. Philosophy in a certain way, ever since Plato, ever since you know, the trial of Socrates, can be understood as having to litigate on behalf of itself, right? Philosophy always is accused and it has its enemies and it has to defend itself before a court of authority. 
And so the name of Plato today actually marks a veredict or a dividing line, not only within philosophy itself, should we be Platonist, should we be naturalist, should we be this, should we do that, but concerning the existence and the nature of philosophy itself. Because philosophy, as you might all know, those of you who are uh, even marginally familiar with Nietzsche, has come under considerable stress from very different angles. Philosophy is oftentimes pathologized. Philosophy is considered to be something very bad to have happened, something that has held the reins of Western imaginations for far too long. Of course, here we're understanding philosophy as just the Western philosophical tradition. And of course, insofar as Plato is the father of this long tradition, to attack philosophy and to put philosophy under trial is to stage a retrial of Socrates and Plato's works themselves. Eduardo, you have your hand up. Um, I was thinking on regard to this, um, how can we, under, if you could comment a little bit on the idea of anti-philosophy that like uh, Badiou brings and how it works with this notion and he points to some others, which would be like um, Lacan and St. Augustine, I think as well, Wittgenstein. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So that's a, that's a, that's a, so the concept of anti-philosophy is a concept that was, well, I'm sure the term has been used before, but it's introduced as a, as a technical term by Alain Badiou. Um, and he uses it to refer a particular tradition that emerges in, within philosophy, but it also challenges the valences of philosophy. Whereas philosophy defends the possibility of truth, the possibility of knowledge, etc. The anti-philosopher claims that the philosophical aspiration towards truth is not only impossible, but even pathological. And that in contrast to this emphasis on knowledge, truth, being, whatever, um, the anti-philosopher pr uh, proposes the, pr the, the preponderance of an act of something like a pragmatic fundamental gesture. Um, who is the paradigmatic modern anti-philosopher? Of course, is Nietzsche for him. Nietzsche is the great um, critic of philosophy, the great anti-philosopher of our time, but in the 20th century, Lacan is considered to be a great anti-philosopher. Um, and he, he goes back, I mean, in the modern period, there are earlier uh, figures as well. Um, so anti-philosophy, even though it can be considered a kind of philosophical tradition, it is something that emerges within the horizon of philosophy. And what's interesting is that at least in its Nietzschean variant, right, the assault against philosophy is global. It's not just against a particular subset of philosophy or parts of philosophy, but it is against philosophy in its historical being. And this in, in, uh, involves a direct confrontation with the Socratic tradition, with Socrates as a historical literary figure almost, and with Plato as a philosopher. And we're going to talk about that and, and about the Nietzschean assault in a little bit. Aaron, go for it. Just a quick one. One thing that I found really interesting and that kind of led to my reading of Plato was uh, some of Seller's essays on Plato, uh, yeah. where I feel like he almost gives a reading of Plato as a like almost has this kind of neo-pragmatist yes. Plato, right? That leads through Hegel. Um, and that that in some ways bears a kind of resemblance to the anti, <laughs> like the the pragmatist anti philosophy, where where philosophy is in contemplation but is activity. Um, I don't know if is that is that something that you're interested in drawing on as well, yeah. or? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's something that I've absolutely been uh, also. I mean, there's a that's a part of a long history. So um, I think that the way that uh, Sellers reads Plato in particular has to do with similarly how Sellers uh, systematizes and positivizes some of the deflationary conclusions that are set to follow from the late Wittgenstein, the pragmatist Wittgenstein. So similarly, he tries to assimilate into a kind of positive register, into kind of positive pragmatics, certain deflationary attitudes that we're taking with regards to Plato specifically by people like Gregory Vlastos, right? And all these discussions concerning the third man and so on. So what you have is a kind of attempt to systemat, to think of Plato, yes, as a pragmatist, but not in the anti-philosophical sense in which pragmatism as Wittgenstein thought would be 
you know, uh, anathema to systematization or positive construction. He wants to actually say that, no, we can have a kind of positive pragmatics, a kind of pragmatism that is actually within philosophical constructive uh, horizons, right? And that's how he reads on essentially, which is very, very, very cool. Um, and it, I think it also has to be read through the lenses of how it is that uh, Sellers, of course, mixes together or hybridizes this kind of pragmatist tradition and neo-Kantianism in a certain way. So it's it's complicated. I'm, I'm not going to get into that right now, but 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 it's a uh, that's what's going on there. I'm no, of there. course, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, so the retrial of Socrates and the accusation against philosophy. On the one hand, we have those who say that philosophy must be desecrated, right? And with it, that philosophy maybe as a whole has to be considered to be something that's ill, fundamentally nefarious, even dangerous. As you might know, Nietzsche defines his own endeavor, philosophical or anti-philosophical endeavor, as one of overturning Platonism. He considers this to be a mission, and we're going to look at this a little bit later. But this mission requires is required not only for us to get rid of someone who says really uh, nefarious stuff. The overcoming of Platonism for Nietzsche is a key to overcoming the swamp of nihilism, which was, of course, the ultimate endpoint of modernity and its results in Europe, right? This kind of thing, which he called weary nihilism at the end of the day. In the 20th century, Heidegger radicalizes this kind of critique that is given by Nietzsche. And he defines that, in fact, the West, the Western philosophical tradition and Western history as a whole was determined, in fact, already in Plato. Heidegger famously claims that the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, beginning with Plato, occluded the fundamental question of being by subordinating being to the idea, to presence. So Plato hides the veiling of being already in the name of the disclosure and purity of the idea of of course, the idos, which is supposed to come to a kind of intellectual intuition or disclosure to the mind, to the intelligible domain. But in doing so, Heidegger thinks the mystery of being is closed, shut down, and forgotten eventually. So again, to defy, to destroy, to deconstruct this history of, of Platonism holds the key to unraveling that which has determined the fate of Western history, including its mo modern dereliction. What Heidegger famously claims is that the Nietzschean diagnosis concerning Plato as a moralist, as someone who inculcates the reactive values of the priest already in kind of a complicity with Christianity, of course, is actually to be read more profoundly as an ontological pollution. Uh, so the beginning of a long history of ontological amnesia that leads Western history into a path towards what finally will become modern nihilism. So in this trajectory, Plato is just more than just a philosopher, right? He is somebody who holds, whose name encapsulates a decision, a historical destiny, right? And we must break with this destiny. This destiny has been shown to the extent Western history has to be brought under trenchant criticism, to the extent that nihilism, metaphysics, et cetera, are all really bad things. We have to overcome this. Now, I will be speaking more in more detail about these enemies of Plato um, later on. But as I mentioned also, in the 20th and 21st centuries, we have seen a resurgence of Plato. Uh, in the French, for example, in the French post-structuralist tradition, and more recently, we have seen also a vested interest in Plato by the so-called neo-rationalist uh, vector that sprawls out of what was sometimes called speculative realism, right? And for these thinkers, um, Plato holds something like the keys today to rehabilitate conceptions of truth and rationality against all kinds of relativism, against the kind of preponderance of vitalist and correlationist philosophy, philosophies that are anti-realist in nature. And also, Plato holds the key to actually overcome not only cultural relativism at the theoretical end, but it holds something like a political key to overcome the contemporary democratic fetish 
this kind of democratic cult of opinions that caters all too naturally to the neoliberal capitalist constituency. So Plato is actually seen to be keen not only to overcome theoretical problems, but even for a reconstituted project for emancipatory egalitarian politics. We know that, of course, this is how Badiou reads him, but not exclusively. In fact, many of the contemporary Platonists want to say that there's something precisely about Plato's deprivatized account of intelligence or Plato's emphasis on the negative that enables us to, or that is key to overcome the democratic fetish that holds us hostage to neoliberal capitalism today. Uh, and this is interesting because what it's trying to, to do is to see in Plato not only the keys towards a materialism in the abstract, in the you know, sort of fundamental sense in which matter is the basic category of being, but dialectical materialism even, right? In the Marxist sense. Now, the analytic tradition has had a less abrasive relationship to Platonism. Platonism was never considered to be something that was, yeah, altogether a horrible thing to be, even though there are those like, for example, Karl Popper, who famously launched a nefarious critique of Plato, saying that Plato is the source of all things totalitarian in our culture, and that therefore he had to be overcome. But, you know, Plato has a veritable history of being considered to be quite interesting and acceptable, in fact, in different domains of philosophical practice, like the philosophy of science and language. Quine, Willem van Norman Quine, for example, called himself a reluctant Platonist. Um, and he even went as far as endorsing a kind of Pythagoreanism. Now, why and why is this interesting? This is going to go back to the mathematics question. And I think that's a core, core po uh, point that we have to look at. Um, I'm just taking a look at the chat real quick, but it seems to be fine. Now, let me begin by uh, introducing a couple of terms that I think are going to guide our path. And this is going to inform how we look at certain uh, distinctions here. So first, Platonism in philosophy is sometimes set to contrast to naturalism, and sometimes it's set to contrast to nominalism. So maybe as a matter of, it's a good point of departure to define what these terms are. Generally, Platonism is considered to be the thesis according to one, according to which one is a metaphysical realist about immaterial or supersensible class of entities, the forms or the ideas, where the latter are conceived as abstract universals accessed by mathematical cognition. And I should also add their dialectical cognition. And we're going to have to talk about what that means, right? And in this sense, so Platonism is the idea that there exist these entities, these realities that are supersensible or immaterial the ideas or the forms. This is what is usually considered to be Platonism. And in this sense, it is contrasted with naturalism, where naturalism, in contrast, is the thesis according to which one is a metaphysical realist about the entities described observationally and experimentally by the natural sciences and nothing besides. But one, more, one might more, uh, more, more, more generously uh, or, or broadly say that Platonism can be contrasted with any kind of discourse that claims that there are no super sensible, non-observational abstract entities, that the only things that exist are particulars or concrete particulars, whether these concrete particulars be defined or described by the natural sciences or by the social sciences or by some other register that is amenable to observational descriptions. The point is Plato defends the existence of these non-observational entities. Uh, there's a comment in the chat. Zenobia just asked, would naturalism be another name for empiricism? So yes and no. Uh, in this traditional or originary, originary sense, um, it's usually this distinction between Platonism and naturalism does correspond to a distinction between rationalism and empiricism. Why? Because this is usually used specifically by analytic philosophers to think of the relationship between Plato and Aristotle where Aristotle is considered to be a naturalist, but also an empiricist. Uh, but as we will see, not necessarily, not necessarily, because you could claim in theory that super sensible entities are in some way, nevertheless, accessible to some kind of intuition as opposed to some kind of super sensible uh, 
sort of dimension or non-observational dimension. There's a kind of observational dimension even to the supersensible entities or to the, not to the supersensible in this regard, but the forms, right? In other words, that we shouldn't understand the forms as supersensible entities, but that they have a quality that is not accessible through observation in the, in the narrow sense. Um, we're going to see why exactly this is not uh, a particularly uh, clean distinction in a very, in very short notice. But so, someone had their hand up. Uh, I think it was, um, uh, who was it, who was it? I had my hand up for a second. I, yes, I, I, please. I just have a question about nominalism. Yes, so absolutely. When this asserts that there's no uh, like realist existence of abstract entities, when, when you say abstract entities, are these, are these taken to be like, like universals or, or forms in that sense? Or is it like any kind of abstraction whatsoever? Like, so forms, mind, are, yes, um, thank like you. Whole, as a whole, as opposed to like an individual person or something like that. Thank you, thank you. So abstract entities is the genus of which forms would be a species, right? So it includes universals, but it also includes things like, for example, numbers or sets. Mathematical idealities are sometimes considered to be abstract, right? So for example, Pythagoreans, right, are metaphysical realists about mathematical entities by definition. That's what Pythagoreanism means in philosophy. If you believe that numbers are real in the sense that they exist somewhere, right, um, that would be considered to be an abstract entity, right? Uh, so abstract entities are contrasted to concrete particulars. So a concrete particular would be canonically a individual substance, a primary substance in Aristotelian uh, nomenclature, right? So this horse, <laughs> right, is a primary substance, but things like genera, right, or species are sometimes considered to be abstract. Uh, numbers, sets, all kinds of mathematicals, universals also, right? which is going to lead us to the obvious, there's, there's an obvious tension here. There's something that needs to be said, right? Because immediately I just said something that should perplex uh, everybody, but let's see if, if we get there. So Aaron just goes, oh, this just makes me want to jump right to the sofas. It's cruel, we'll have to wait. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, Sorry, Daniel? Uh, yes? I have, a, I have a question. By all means, yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, can you uh, say a name of an author that is nominalism, nominalist? I don't know how to say it. <laughs> yes, well, uh, we just heard about a famous nominalist who is Wilfred Sellers uh, in, in, in the contempt. So Sellers is, is famously uh, uh, a trenchant critic of Platonism, not only in the philosophy of language, but in metaphysics, and he defends a process monist ontology that Re completely refuses the existence of all abstract entities, not only universals, but all abstracts. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because I, I remember when you when you explain about the nominalism, I remember this kind of thing about the 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 conflict between the the manifest image of the of the of the human and the um, scientific image of the human, and it's yes. it's all about that. Yeah. Well, well it's all about. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, that distinction uh, operates in a slightly different register, oh. but, but it turns out that he thinks that, yes, the scientific image of the world eventually requires a new kind of metaphysics, a new naturalist metaphysics, a process metaphysics, which is also a process gnomist, uh, uh, sorry, monist metaphysics that is also nominalist in character, that rejects any kind of appeals to abstract entities. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's many essays uh, about this, but if you want to read about Sellers' nominalism, I think the best secondary literature, there's an essay on Brandom, which has, uh, by Brandom on Sellers' account of abstract entities that's very, 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 very good. Um, and there he goes to all kinds of lengths, uh, you know, to show how you can deflate appeals to things like the lion, right? The lion, when you say the lion is Tani, you're not committing yourself existentially to the existence of the form of a lion somewhere in the world. You're just simply using this as what's called a distributed singular term. Now, anyway, that's a long story, but, <laughs> um, but yes. So with that in mind, nominalism. So Platonism is also contrasted with nominalism which is precisely the thesis according to which there exists no abstract entities, but only concrete particulars. And sometimes this thesis is broken or taken back to Aristotle. 
Aristotle as well was someone who claimed that above all things, what exists are substances and substances are the most real of them all. The primary substances are concrete particulars. This horse, this person, this zebra, this whatever. So concrete particulars are real, nothing beside. Richard Haim says, does anybody have a link to the Brenda Mizzet? I, I can upload it to the class folder afterwards and I will, okay? But here we see the first problem. And this is going to reveal something interesting for a reading, right? Already here we see that there's something wrong, right? Because if you think about Aristotle, right? He says that there are primary entities. Yes, primary substances are the fundamental items of, of ontology, but he also recognizes the existence of secondary entities or secondary substances. And what are secondary substances? Are species. And in fact, species are necessary to explain what the primary substances are. In other words, if I say this horse, or this is a horse, right? This primary substance can be identified as what it is only insofar as I classify it as a member of a more general category, namely horse, right? That presumably encompasses all the individuals. But these this term horse, which is a species, what is that if not an abstract entity, right? It's a general term. It's a term that supposedly encompasses different individuals. And it's an abstract term that is presumably observationally accessible, right? You can see that, you know, you can see horses. And in every case, you can see that you're seeing a horse. So all of a sudden, the porous, uh, the distinction between nominalism and Platonism becomes slightly finicky, right? Now, here's where things get really crazy, right? So with regards to Platonism and nominalism, this difference is actually kind of uh, more, more, uh, more, more rich than we think at first sight. The big problem for any Platonism in this sense is going to be to define how it is that these abstract universals interact with concrete particulars. How it is that, in other words, the world of concrete particulars, individuals that populate the material universe somehow interact with these abstract forms, right? In this traditional reading. And this is in Plato, what we're going to see is the problem of participation. This is what the problem of participation is all about. How is it that sensible particulars participate in the idea and by doing so receive the action of the idea? This is what is usually the problem of participation, which we will uh, have a chance to talk to. But it is also the problem of epistemology of how to pass from icasia to noesis. Icasia being the contemplation of images which is at the bottom level of the divided line, right? At the very beginning, which corresponds in the allegory of the cave, as we all know, to the shadows projected onto the wall by the prisoners, right? To noesis, which is the contemplation of forms. And finally, of course, at the highest level of what Plato calls the form of the good or the first principle. So there is also an epistemological line here that goes that that has to do with this interaction between the concrete particulars, right? At the bottom level, the images, and then the concrete objects of the world that are the objects of pistis, all the way up to the form of the good in the intelligible order, which corresponds to noesis or episteme. But it is also an ethical and existential problem, the existential problem of catharsis. The idea of how does one purify the soul from its admixtures and confusions with the body. In other words, the preparation for death. How is it that through philosophy, one prepares oneself for death precisely by purifying the body, by making it approximate wisdom? And what that requires, we will have to explore, of course, in more detail. And it is finally also, of course, the political problem, which is how it is that we overcome this multiplicity of individual opinions, which is, of course, the democratic triumph of sophistry, and ex access the construction of the Kalipolis, which is the construction of a society, an organization of society, a political state, 
in which wisdom reigns, in which, of course, we have a kind of rational, enlightened society. And again, what the Kalipolis or Kalipolis uh, means and how it's supposed to be constructed, we will have to see. But as you can see, in all of these registers, we are concerned with a problem of interaction between the sensible particulars, the multiplicity of bodies, of opinions, of thoughts that exist in the world here. And on the other hand, access to something which would presumably be removed from this multiplicity, something more general, universal, right? So the problem of participation is not just an ontological, well, the problem of participation is an ontological problem, but it corresponds to the problem of epistemological ascent from Achesis to Noesis, the problem of catharsis, of the purification of the soul, and finally to the pro political problem of the construction of the polis or the calipolis. Now, conversely, nominalist naturalisms, to the extent that you know, th those uh, two terms can be and have been paired together, will have an opposite set of problems, right? The problem for the nominalist will be, how do you explain how there can be generality in nature so that we can describe anything at all if there are no abstract entities, right? Why, in other words, is not everything a haicity? A haicity is a term that means that everything is irreducibly singular, that there are no general kinds in nature, so that you cannot, in fact, say there is a horse here and there is a horse over there. I'm sitting in a chair and so are you. Everything in the world is a individuality or a haicity or a singularity of its own. Nietzsche it makes this point very clearly in uh, a famous essay of his that ever, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have read on truth and lies in the non-moral sense. He says that language, the primary function of language is to render equal what is unequal in itself. So we call this group of singularities a zebra, right? Or zebra, sorry. Um, by alighting the differences that makes each of them individuals. But the problem is that how can you even talk about this anything whatsoever without classifying the particular under a more general term? How do you understand this participation under a more general term if you do not accept the reality of, gen uh, of, of abstract uh, universals or anything like that? Uh, Lika, you have your hand up? Go for it. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask about uh, the first uh, principles. Is it a technical term from uh, Plato's interpret uh, interpreters or it, it was used by him? It is used by him. He actually refers to it. And we'll, we're going to see the quote in, his, in Republic 7, in fact, in discussion with Glaucon, when, it, when he's precisely describing the song or the hymn of the dialectic, depending on your translation, he makes this point that it is only when you get to dialectics that you pass from the, so the, the ascent to first principles is the transition between from simply knowing mathematics, which correspond to the realm in the divided line, as you know, of an, uh, hypothetical idealities, which are analytical in nature, to dialectical idealities. Now, what is, what is the nature of these first principles? That would be the question, right? And what is the distinction between the quote unquote derived principles, which presumably furnish the world of mathematics, including the natural sciences, astronomy, right? But how do you move, how do you go from there, from this multiplicity of sciences? to first principles. Uh, and just to spoiler alert, I guess, like sort of just to, 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 to go ahead a little bit ahead of ourselves, it has to do with a principle of composition, right? You have all of these sciences, right? You have astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and then, you know, warfare, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have harmonics, of course, the science of motions, of astronomy, of the celestial bodies and harmonics. But there has to be something that binds them together. Now you might be thinking, why? Why has to be, there be something that, that binds them together? The way to think about this, I think, has to do with two subsidiary concepts. One is the concept of teleology, which we're gonna get to. And the other thing is we have to think about it analogously to how we think about, for example, in the history of mathematics, something like the search for the foundations of arithmetic or the search for foundations of mathematics in the 19th century, which led to, for example, set theory, later to category theory, homotopy type theory, the search for univalent foundations. 
one of the things that I'm going to interrogate and that we're going to be asking as we move along is whether Plato, and in what sense, Plato was a foundationalist. Foundationalism is the epistemological thesis according to which there exist certain sets of beliefs or some bits of knowledge that are themselves underived, but that serve as the justificatory ground for any other beliefs or any other knowledge that exists. In other words, you are a foundationalist if and only if you believe there is a subset of knowledge that produces, that functions as the justificatory ground for any other kind of knowledge, that there are, you know, that there's a primitive ground level floor. Uh, and we're going to see what this would mean in the case of Plato. Um, anybody else has their hands up? I, I don't see here. Yana. Um, yeah. Um, I don't mean to uh, set anybody back uh, by this question, but like, are we trying to do this by kind of like entirely like bypassing the, the kind of like quagmire of like sensorial perception of in the sense of like, are we gonna totally fucking ignore Kant um, in trying to <laughs> answer this question? Um, no, we're not. <laughs> we're definitely not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to be like a proponent of Kant. Uh, I'm. I'm also like ready to ignore that. Uh, but um, the question for me is like how um, how this um, kind of like epistemological trap um, is going to um kind of detour the fact that yeah there is the um the kind of implication that yeah sensorial perception is going to model stuff down so okay. that's i mean that, that's exactly the question that we're asking right now which is what's the interaction between the entities that are amenable to be sensorially perceptually disclosed to us which are you know usually considered to be those entities that are liable to empirical investigation and on the other hand, we have these quote unquote, quote unquote idealities that are supposed to be mathematical, abstract in nature, that are supposedly removed from the sensorial or the visible world or order, right? And the question is, is this really as clean a division as sometimes we are led to think by the commentary? And I think as soon as like in the, like the next uh, slide, we're going to see that it, is, it really is not. First of all, because we understand already, right, just by looking at this distinction between nominalism and Platonism, that both of them seem to have a problem within themselves, right? The problem of participation is a problem, but also for nominals, it's a problem to explain how you can have only concrete particulars to the, where you cannot eventually classify anything under a more general term. Even Sellers has to, like, essentially cheat when he introduces concrete particulars as pure processes. Um, but this shows that there's something much more precise in this kind of distinction between the visible and the intelligible than has been led to. And we're gonna to get to that very soon. Uh, but hold on, let me take a look at the chat very quickly. Enda just asked, uh, how should we best understand the minimum condition for a thing's being an entity in this context? When we say that abstract universals are real, what modality are taken to be real? Well, that's another, I mean, a, a, a good question would be to say, what is the criterion of individuation for any of these entities at all these orders? Are there, is there one criterion, right? One thing that, that Plato seems to, to, to sort of assume, let's say, right, is that there is a kind of organic correlation between different faculties or different exercises of cognitive capacities and different classes of objects, right? You have images, you have you know, perceptual objects, which are the objects of belief. You have these hypothetical idealities, and then you have the dialectical idealities with the form of the good at the top. However, what's the criterion for individuation? Well, I don't know if there is a, there, there's both criteria for individuation, which is the ontological criteria, right? And we can, we can define what those are. There's also a criteria for epistemological access. So, for example, what is an image? What's an iconis? It is something that is derived, that is ontologically derived from a concrete object, right? It is something that has to have a derived ontological status, right? So, and epistemologically, iconis, right? Icasis has to be a derived epistemological uh, gesture in, in relationship to pistis, 
to the capacity to form beliefs. You couldn't in fact see the shadow of something if in fact you don't have the capacity to see generally objects. In other words, in order to recognize a reflection, you need to be able to recognize the object of which this thing is a reflection of or an image of. But then of course, particular objects must presuppose the ideas, hypothetical idealities, right? To be a horse presupposes horse. And this means that pistis supposes some knowledge of hypothetical idealities of the ideas and so on and so forth. We're not there yet, but we're gonna look at this in precisely how Plato constructs the divided line and how there is this correspondence between epistemology and ontology in uh, Republic 7. Which incidentally, I should just say before we move any, any further, the reason why we started with Republic 7 today before delving right into the last days of Socrates, which we're gonna be doing like starting next week, uh, is because Republic 7 is oftentimes considered to be not only like the most rat, I suppose, uh, you know, bit of, of, of Socrates other than the apology perhaps, right? Because of the famous allegory of the cave and so on. But it is also because it's considered to be this kind of middle dialogue, right? It is where Plato sort of more clearly produces out this kind of rehearsal of the theory of the forms in tandem with a kind of project that is practical in nature, political in nature, right? The construction of the Kallipolis, right? The Republic. But that is, I think, what allows us to use as a platform to just understand some basic concepts that we can then look in these other works to see how they actually are fleshed out in more detail. Um, so that's the reason why I, I use this as a stopgap. So in any case, uh, just going back real quick, uh, Lika, you have your hand up again. Is, is that for further intervention or was that from before? No, sorry, I didn't. Oh, no worries, no. Just, just making sure, thank you. So uh, hopefully like the lesson at this point is clear that you know the resurgence of Platonism today is not only a theoretical but a practical enterprise that in fact holds a key to a political project, right? Now, as I mentioned, um, Plato, uh, Platonism is not only contrasted to naturalist nominalisms, but with naturalism more generally. And here goes the caricature of Plato that we all hear and we have all heard at some point, right? That Plato believes that the sensible world is illusory. He upholds the reality of ideas and ideas alone. Plato denies becoming, but only affirms the reality of unitary being. Plato subordinates the many to the one, right? This is the Parmenidean Plato. Plato endorsed a teleological metaphysics with the form of the good at the culprit against the mechanistic view of the world upheld by Democritian atomists. Those of you who took the seminar uh, with me about structuralism will remember this dualism uh, or this duality, sorry. Then Plato, the rationalist for whom knowledge is derived from recollection. This is another term that we're gonna be going uh, to, of course, but not from experience. This is, this is the Plato that I'm sure we've all heard of a million times. But this is a caricature for a reason, right? Because first of all, Plato thinks that the forms are mathematically organized. So that means that they can be, and they in fact are the subject of study for science, right? So it is not the case that we have a distinction between the empirical world as a word, which is amenable to description and so on. And then we have these mysterious idealities somewhere. No, the forms have a mathematical structure and they are the subject study of science. So they are continuous with empirical investigation. After all, in the description from Republic 7, when he's detailing the pedagogical program for the polis, one of the things that we know is that it's not only pure mathematics as we would understand it, but the geometry and arithmetic give way to what? Harmonics, to astronomy, and of course, a science of motion, right? Which of course is incomplete as far as Plato is concerned. So we must understand mathemat when Plato speaks in the Republic, of the 10 years of mathematical training that is required before entering or venturing into the realm of dialectics, Plato is saying, or including within this domain of mathematics, any kind of also empirical study, scientific study that is attained through mathematical cognition, like astronomy, for example, right? So that's already a qualification that's important. <coughs> Second, to say, that, <coughs> to say that sensible particulars participate in the forms, this relationship of participation is 
just to say that the intelligible forms provide the conditions for individuation or for the unity of any particular. In fact, and this is a point that I've been making for years at now, because I realize, well, for a couple of years, it's something that I think is essential to understand the next point. When Quine and when others call themselves a Platonists, right? It is because Quine in particular, he calls himself a reluctant Platonist, as I mentioned. It is because mathematical idealities are necessary to explain scientific explanation. And it is necessary for naturalism. Quine was a naturalist, but in order to be a naturalist, you needed to explain or to invoke mathematical entities like sets, like numbers, to the extent that number sets and such like formal entities or for, formal uh, you know, postulates are necessary for scientific investigation, universals and Platonism is necessary for naturalism. That's the irony. It's not that you need that Platonism and naturalism are in fact in tension with each other, right? Because after all, as we know from the modern period, the thesis of Mathesis, the thesis of Mathesis Universalis is precisely the thesis according to which nature is written in mathematical language. And this means that nature is itself inscribed in the language of the forms. They're formalized, right? This already should tell you something very obvious about why it is that today, both naturalist and materialist programs see in Platonism actually something quite central, right? Because it is after all mathematics that holds an ontological priority. So it is not that there is the sensible empirical world on the one hand and then the maths and the forms that are abstract on the other. The maths are the conditions for understanding the empirical domain itself, right? And that's what, of course, the scientific ideal tells us, right? The next thing is that the forms are not as it's usually said to be, these isolated idealities in relation to each other, which are these kind of, they are monoedetic in the sense that the form of the good is the form of the good and not the form of the good and then something else. The form of the tree is just the form of the tree, right? And so on. But it turns out that the forms also have a relation to each other. They're dialectically organized in relationship to their opposites. And in fact, this is, as we will see much later on, one of the lessons of the Parmenides, but you already see it rehearsed in both Republic, but also in the Phaedo, the idea that the one and the many inhere in each other, and that in fact, one cannot assert the ontological priority of one and the other. So in fact, what, what, what we will see is that the movement or the passage from pure mathematics science to dialectics corresponds to the pedagogical program of the Kalipolis, Kalipolis, sorry, I keep saying Kalipolis. Uh, in this transition, right? there is also a transition from analytical thinking, which sees the forms in isolation. Like for example, when you, like, let's give an example, right? Think about uh, you are a mathematician, a geometrician, you're performing, or you're an engineer, okay? Even better. Uh, sorry, there's a comment in the chat that I need to read. So what is ontological priority? Sorry if that's an obvious question. It seems possible to me that mathematics provides a useful collection of tools for understanding particulars, but that seems like a different claim. A useful collection of tools for understanding. Uh, well, so that's, that's, that's a difficult question. I think that what he means by ontological priority is that you cannot understand the conditions for individuation of any entity without understanding that which has ontological priority over it. In other words, you cannot understand what it would be like to be an uh, object, not, not, just what, not just epistemologically. You cannot understand what it would be to be a zebra if there wasn't a form or idea of the zebra to begin with. The, um, there's an ontological priority insofar as the conditions for individuation of specific zebras or a specific axis require you to postulate the idea of these more general kinds. Um, now, why exactly do you need this, right? Can you just say that, you know, 
there is a kind of uh, a kind of emergence of these higher order properties or features from the lower level particulars. That is a debate that is actually had right now. Uh, that's one, one of the debates, whether in fact you move from the particulars to the generals or whether the generals provide the conditions for generation of the particulars, right? And it seems like Plato's saying the, that in fact, the, the, the principles provide the generation of uh, the, the conditions for generation of particulars. And the reason why that is, is because I think he thinks that the conditions at the top, so the forms, include morphogenetic conditions. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit when we talk about teleology and function and what the forms, uh, the forms have a functional dimension within them that is not usually understood. And this is something that I think we get a clue of in different places, but I have uh, more to say about that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bit. So in any case, so the forms are organized in relation to each other. Oh, Sean. Yes. Franz, Sean uh, has his hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. sorry, just, just a quick question. Um, sure. I'm sort of wondering if I'm sort of wondering why Aristotle's primary and secondary substances uh, would imply that he concedes to um, Plato's naturalistic convergence. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you can help me sort of explain, because it, it's a predicate and, and you could just, I mean, you could say that they're just sort of accidental, you know, things about language that we use to describe and navigate reality. Like, why does that uh, come into, how does that confirm Plato? Well, th that would be the case. So you could say you can adopt a deflationary attitude and say mm -hmm. predication and so classification of a particular under a more general kind, right? This is a zebra or take your whatever predicate of choice, right? Can be uh, deflationarily understood as a simple linguistic phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that in the case of Aristotle himself, he claims that secondary substances are species, right? I mean, that they are substances themselves. It's not just an artifact of language. It's not just an artifact of predication. So the question is, of course, what is a species? Zebra, whatever, biped animal, right? And so on. If they are not just mere predicative uh, sort of concoctions, right? One of the big, uh, I think, tricks of the analytic tradition, which likes Aristotle very much, is to try to dissociate kind of in, in, across the lines of what you were suggesting, the predicative element from the metaphysical element. But it seems like, and this is something that you, you, you get taught very early on when you're reading Aristotle in an analytic school, is that Aristotle in fact takes these uh, predicative determinations to be ontologically pregnant. So it's not just that they are ways of chopping up the pie through language that are used by you know, us as a means of convention. Classification, mm -hmm. Uh, implies ontological commitment and secondary substances are these general kinds, they're species, right? So it seems like it, he's biting the bullet there. Got it, okay, thank you. <laughs> so here we go, let me let me stop there actually for one second because I'm sweating and uh, there's there's some other stuff. Uh, so yeah, um, any any thoughts, any, any comments? Anybody wants to jump in? There's much more. Will, go for it. Yeah, just a general question about kind of on that point of Quine, like having to necessarily smuggle in a Platonism that he's reluctant to do. Like, would you say that when one wants to naturalize epistemology, that like formalization is like always going to be the Janus face of that naturalization? Is that kind mm. of what you, or how would you, how would you like conceptually map that relation of like what, what naturalism, naturalism is always having to formalize. I, well, yeah. so you're, go, you're going to definitely have to explain formalization and the role of mathematical explanation. Uh, but I don't think you're necessarily going to be committed to a, 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 a Platonist view according to which the mathematics necessarily holds ontological purchase because you could, I suppose, and people do, um, engage in quasi, you know, in instrumentalist, anti-realist, uh, accounts that will say that, you know, sure, the, the, the science, the maths are heuristic devices, that they are conventions that help us uh, form predictions, explanations, explanatory schemas, whatever you want, but that they actually do not describe anything in the world proper, that they, they carry no ontological weight. In other words, you could be a strong correlationist about this, right, and say something like, sure, the, the practice of science requires requires us to make use of these 
mathematical tools and ideality and make reference to these mathematical idealities. Um, but we should understand this necessity as a pragmatic necessity, as opposed to an ontological necessity, right? So you can, you can cash out the necessity of having to make use of these in non-ontological terms and therefore escape the Platonist bullet. But to the extent that Quine was a naturalist and he believed that ontology, you know, you have to remember that one thing that Quine is interested in, even though he's a behaviorist in, in, in some aspects, he's trying to like essentially come up, render compatible all the things that were considered to be incompatible before him, right? Naturalism, empiricism, functionalism, behaviorism, realism, you name it. And his naturalism wants to say that, you know, physics holds an ontological priority. Physics describes what is real in the world. It's not just some convention among many possible conventions that is liable to some kind of cultural sort of contextualist uh, deflationary attitude. It's more than just a language game. Physics tells us what is real and physics is mathematically couched or mathematically you know, formalized. Therefore, to the extent that we speak about these idealities, uh, we must accept them to be part of our ontology. So um, that's the case of Quine. Any other thoughts? No? Cool. So, oh, sorry, there's a, here we go. So the next thing I want to, to do is uh, talk a little bit about before go, oh, sorry, there's a, it may be a stupid formulation, but can we say the mathematics here can be viewed as undivided matter? Um, no, I don't think so because math so math so mathematics, of course, is a discourse, right? So mathematics, the question is whether this discourse represents anything in the world that's actually you know real or, or whatever. Uh, but mathematics does not describe a, 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 a single undivided reality or undivided matter. In fact, it provides the conditions for the individuation and therefore for the division of matter. If Plato is right, in other words, you know when you describe the difference between a triangle. And a, and a circle or a tetrahedron, right? Uh, take your geometrical figures of, of choice. What you're saying is that these mathematical principles enable you to understand any kind of morphogenetic differences in the world. That anything that is a circle or that would approximate being a circle in the empirical world is precisely governed by these invariant principles, structural laws or, 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 or mathematical you know, laws. So. So it's actually a principle of division, if anything, right? Mathematics is a discourse that allows us to understand the, di the differences in being, right? Sorry, uh, can I then ask uh, uh, why, uh, so why then uh, Deleuze is uh, so uh, not, uh, is why he hates Plato if uh, he tells the same, he tells us the same, he tells us the difference lies in the, you know, the most uh, basic real. So I, I, I don't think that, I don't think he hates Plato. I think he hates Aristotle or he doesn't like Aristotle. Aristotle is the enemy. But with Plato, he has a much more ambiguous relationship in fact. And in fact, he thinks that Plato holds the key to an ontology of difference. Uh, I actually have a, a, I'm going to talk about that once we get to the, to the brief history of Platonism bit. Uh, I have a, a, a segment where I'm, I have a couple quotes by Deleuze where he talks directly about this, one from difference and repetition, the other from logic of sense, where he directly uh, tells us what it is in Plato that he thinks is the key. Surprisingly enough, uh, it is not in this case the forms, the account of the forms, but the account of simulacra, right, which is going to be important. But at the end of the day, he does have a mathematical account of ideas. So, you know. I don't know. I think he's more of a Platonist than he would ever uh, perhaps want to say. Personally, I think that. Um, let me go here. So the other thing that, of course, uh, we uh, one thing that's obvious that you know, mo moving back to, to to sort of higher latitude, is does it make sense to ask about what is the form of philosophy, right? And this is another thing that was announced in the kind of course description, right? which is if we apply a kind of platonic form of reasoning to philosophy itself, right? Then we have to say that philosophy 
is something more than just a variety of exemplars, right? There's this philosopher, there's that philosopher, there's this philosophical book. Uh, you know, there's this famous definition of Whitehead, which says that every philosophy is essentially defined as a series of footnotes of Plato. Or Rorty says that, you know, I don't think you can do any better when you're defining what philosophy is than just saying there is a list of these books beginning with Plato and then moving forward to, you know, all the way until now. But to ask the question, well, is there underlying all these multiple works, authors, names, et cetera, something about like an invariant kernel of philosophical questioning, a philosophical essence, right? And this is something that I think reveals uh, a crucial aspect of Plato's methodology, which I presume some of us might know is titled uh, oftentimes the Elenchus the Socratic Alenkis. Now, Plato shows or engages with different methods. There's the method of division, there's the Alenkis. The Alenkis is essentially what is considered to be the dominant form or the dominant method of the so-called Socratic dialogues. The dialogues where Socrates engages with an interlocutor and starts to interrogate the assumptions and beliefs and positions of the interlocutor with the result that, as you know, after the interlocutor has presented their thesis, after a little bit, it turns out that A, they contradict themselves, B, they rule by example. And this is usually the big bad that Plato finds with his interlocutors in the Socratic dialogues, right? Which is that the interlocutors have a horrible tendency to try to define a term by exemplifying the term, as opposed to by giving a definition. So whereas the Elenchus is usually considered to be a method of question and refutation, you always have to remember that the point of the Elenchus, this question refutation method, is supposed to be conducive or just instrumental towards arriving at a real definition. And a real definition is one that cannot be satisfied by exemplification, right? Now, what is the pursuit of a definition? This is what is precisely called the logos. The logos is the pursuit for a definition or an account that implies the possibility of selecting between possible candidate theories or definitions. So to be more formal slightly, when you're asking the question, what is X, whatever X might be, you cannot answer that question according to Socrates, right? By just simply giving a catalog of the things that are said to be X, right? This is the method of X simplification. Any more than you can just give a definition by a genealogical recount of how X came to be, nor just giving any arbitrary definition whatsoever. You need to be able to defend the definition, exclude the rivals. So with that in mind, we can ask the question, is there an invariant kernel, a definition of philosophy that underlies its historical becoming, right? And this is the part that, another thing that's interesting, I think, is that this way of formulating the question, I think approximates a kind of transcendental vocabulary, right? And a kind of Kantian vocabulary. It is to ask something like, the conditions of all possible philosophy, right? Insofar as philosophy is a discourse and it is historically exemplified by a variety of philosophers, schools, traditions, orientations, texts, books, authors, blah, blah, blah. Is there nevertheless something that allows us to say, well, philosophy is, or any possible philosophy needs to meet these conditions in order to be so, thus and so. If not, the result is that there is no clear border between philosophy and its other where the other would be any other form of discourse or discipline or practice, right? So is there such a thing as the possibility of a logos of philosophy itself? This is a kind of metaphilosophical enterprise, right? And one of the methodological problems is that in asking this question, in trying to answer this question in the affirmative, right, one seems to presuppose already something that is precisely being interrogated. In other words, to even ask or to attempt to find invariant conditions, transcendental conditions of all possible philosophy, right, is to already presuppose that there are these things called essences, transcendental conditions, whatever you want. 
Now, this might seem because of this formulation rather arcane, right? Isn't this like precisely the kind of essentialism that since Wittgenstein we've learned or since you know, Nietzsche we've learned that is a bad thing, right? The idea that there is this invariant kernel that underlies all of these language games. Isn't it that we must after all embrace that philosophy is nothing but a cluster of language games held together by nothing but names and you know, authors? But today the pursuit of a quote unquote transcendental derivation of all possible philosophy is alive and well. Not only in, in overtly Platonist territories, but you see this for example, in the work of contemporary transcendental philosophers, Francois Larelle, as you might possibly know, has a project which is called non-philosophy, which attempts exactly that, a transcendental deduction of all possible philosophy that determines what is the philosophical decision that underlie, underwrites every possible philosophy. And this turns out to be for him uh, a very specific construction that goes in every possible philosophy. It's a mixture of transcendence and imminence, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna get into a rel right now, right? But the, the question that I want to isolate from here, which is a question that is important for us, is whether the affirmation of the possibility of a definition or an essence of X, where X includes philosophy, imply an essentialism of the bat type that has been brought under scrutiny by everybody under the sun in the 20th century. In other words, is there a kind of already a polluted core of Platonism in the very search, in the very method for attempting a definition. Now, this becomes, of course, indissociable. The question, what is philosophy? How can we define philosophy? It becomes indissociable from another question, which is what kind of practice is philosophy, right? And I want to, of course, go back to the idea that there's an existential dimension here, right? What kind of life is demanded by philosophy? If there is any consistency, any kind of coherence to philosophy, then it must ordain a set of practical imperatives. It has a normative character, not just for theory, but for conduct, right? After all, we know Socrates is in the business of providing examples of thinking about the political life of the city and our collective well being. So the question, what is philosophy, is indissociable in its Platonic inception from the question, who the hell was Socrates, according to Plato? And this is the core of a concept that uh, I'm going to refer to consistently in, in, in this class, which is the concept of Socratic discipline. And how it is that it is in fact, at the end, in these last days of Socrates, that we see the confrontation with death, Socrates at the time of confronting death, as the consummation of the philosophical life. So, it is the moment in which we can finally come to a verdict about Socrates, the man, and whether he has lived in fact in accordance with a set of principles that would have been considered to be necessary for philosophy to explain. And to just ask in the chat, should we understand the hermeneutics of someone like Gadamer as a hire to this line of questioning, or rather as its proper rival, which is seeking to determine the question of philosophical logos empirically? That's a very interesting question, right? Because you can say, well, of course, Gadamer adopts a kind of historicist route to understand the meaning of terms, where, in fact, you would say, if genealogy is anathema to arriving at secure definitions, then etymological sorts of exercises of the Heideggerian, Gadamerian type, hermeneutic type, won't suffice, right? Because presumably, that kind of exercise, at best, would allow you to, quote unquote, trace back the presuppositions laden in a specific concepts, but they will not allow you to perhaps do something like a transcendental schema for every possible future philosophy or every possible future something, right? But the question is, of course, if something like an etymological historical study of the concept of philosophy itself can allow us to understand something about this invariant transcendental kernel, assuming there is such a thing, right? Assuming there is such a thing. And there the question I don't think is as, as, uh, as, as uh, you know, uh, binary as some people would say, right? Like, yes, I think etymological analysis has a role to play. I don't think it's self-sufficient by itself. I don't think that the hermeneutics of suspicion or any kind of deconstructive destruction, right, is uh, by itself sufficient. 
but it is, it is uh, instrumental to this process, if indeed it is realizable. Um, and well, then I was just going to rehearse a, a little bit about this uh, question of the, the, the uh, practical dimension, the existential dimension of philosophy, but I've already said this in different, in different moments. Now, the other thing that's interesting is something that already Nietzsche paid for, it was the first to really pay emphasis on, which is that despite Plato's aversion to democracy, which we are all familiar with, there's something about the Socratic method and Plato's writings and the very ideal functioning of the Kalipolis, Kalipolis, God damn it, I keep saying this, um, which is woven to a kind of meritocratic idea. And Deleuze also talks about this dimension later on, obviously following from Nietzsche, uh, as kind of the inherent dimension in Plato about the process of selection between rivals. Um, in Plato, you find something like the essence of philosophy has to be a procedure or a method of selection to select between competing opinions, between competing candidates or uh, pretendants, as, as, as Deleuze likes to put it. Which means that even though Plato might abhor democracy in its core, he's still very much a child of his time. That, for example, envisages the symposium as a place where different opinions are corralled and debate each other, and in which, of course, finally the rational one triumphs. Even though he abhors the way that democratic societies have upheld the kind of uh, rule of the mob, as he himself puts it in Republic Five, and also the triumph of sophistry over the force of reasons, nevertheless, there is this inherent democratic dimension to the symposium, to, in other words, the element of, of uh, contestation and debate between rivals. So what distinguishes philosophy precisely from the sophist and from the other alternative claimants is that it produces a criterion of selection that divides the claimants between true and false claimants, between simulacra that fail to meet any kind of standard of resemblance to a model and things that resemble their models, which is the best we can hope for in the world as we live it, including when we pursue wisdom. One of the lessons that we're going to see when we read the Phaedus, the Phaedus, the Phaedo, uh, is that Socrates believes you know, Socrates the character, right? uh, Socrates thinks uh, that in fact, wisdom is a kind of asymptotic ideal that because of the contamination of the body, the philosopher can only approximate and prepare us for, and that therefore death should be in fact considered to be a welcome moment insofar as the philosopher has prepared their souls, their minds, right? to precisely this moment of separation from the body and absolute purification, catharsis, right? So this is what's going to, this, this, this kind of like process of selection that enables us to discern between the multiplicity of opinions. And this process of selection is involving the, the separation between the true and the false, the true and the false claimants is key to understanding what is the systematic integrity of the Socratic method across all these manifestations. And here is a quote uh, from Deleuze from Difference and Repetition. From, uh, this is from the, the patent translation. The one problem which recurs throughout Plato's philosophy is the problem of measuring rivals and selecting claimants. This problem of distinguishing between things and their simulacra within a pseudo genus or a large species presides over his classification of the arts and sciences. Uh, sorry, I need to move the... Uh... It is a question of making a, the difference, thus of operating in the depths of the immediate, a dialectic of the immediate. It is a dangerous trial without threat and without net, for according to the ancient custom of myth and epic, false claimants must die. Magnificent quote, right? Beautiful. So just to get us thrown into like the, the more concrete waters uh, shortly, 
uh, we can see that there is a series of conceptual binaries or dyads that organize the works of Plato and the history of Platonism and that encompass all the different, different domains of philosophy. I haven't included aesthetics here because as I mentioned, I'm not quite there yet, but if anybody wants to take that uh, additional leap, since we are after all in uh, the new center, right? Uh, I would be more than welcome. And these are just some of the, uh, the, the, the diets. I'm not gonna go through them right now because that would take us uh, far too long and you can look at this. I will be uploading the, uh, the presentations after class so that you can review all the points as well. But Aaron, you have, uh, Aaron, you have your, your hand up. Yeah, it was about the last slide actually. So, okay, um, I'll, I'll return here, yeah. Yeah, um, was uh, about the concept of uh, excellence or, or arete. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I, my Greek will be uh, butchering it. But um, I guess I was wondering if if you could talk a bit more about that, if that comes up in the Deleuze at all as, all, at all as well, because there does seem to be an interesting way in which, uh, I guess certainly the way that like Nietzschean left <laughs> theory has, has kind of propped up the, the kind of agonistic democracy, right, or the kind of agonistic liberation uh, as, the, as the kind of emancipatory element in Nietzsche um, uh -huh. versus the way that Plato's sort of well-ordered city uh, is a, fundamentally about the pursuit of excellence rather than, um, I guess this is what I found, I didn't get through all the Baju, but read some summaries in that he makes sort of equality the um, like a core principle of, of his Kalipolis, his communism, whereas um, Plato's Kalipolis is structured for the pursuit of excellence in every area, right? right. And so the fact that you have like genetic, like case of people doing, uh, doing different tasks based on who's best at doing what in the pursuit of excellence in each, like the best, Builder, the best ruler, the best potter, um, what have you, right? Like that these are different structuring principles. Yes. Uh, and if you could compare this kind of egalitarian agon, the aristocratic ag or, or arete uh, and excellence. Yes. Uh, maybe. So one thing is that, you know, arete uh, gets translated sometimes as excellence, but more, more normally as virtue, right? It's virtue, yeah. And the, the concept of virtue has to do, as you mentioned, with something like excellence, but more profoundly, or I think more, more uh, accurately, mm -hmm. it has to do with teleology. There is a connection between telos and arete insofar as what it is to realize, to express a virtue or the virtue of something is the realization of its inherent function. Mm -hmm. and what Socrates or what Plato does is in defining the central virtues of that organized, not only the construction of the Kalipolis, but the philosophical life. He of course mentions piety, courage, all of them are justice, uh, pistis of course, all of them are subordinated to what? What is the so, highest- so This is pistis or dike? Dick is justice. No, pistis, yeah. I'm saying also, pistis is belief. Yeah. Uh, but what, what are all the virtues? Support? There's a higher virtue. The one it, virtue. It's the good. Or, no, no, no. Not the good. No. <laughs> the, the good is the form, yeah. but it is wisdom. It's wisdom. Mm -hmm. Sophia. So yeah. Sophia is the, the quote unquote uh, telos to which all the subsidiary virtues aim toward. Mm -hmm. And so we have, and, and this is a, w one of the things that we are going to see is that Sophia is in fact, not just theoretical knowledge, that mm -hmm. precisely the pursuit of Sophia requires these subordinate uh, virtues in order to coordinate the practical and the theoretical theory and praxis uh, across all these levels. So that the pursuit of wisdom is not only you reading books, becoming well-informed in the sciences and math, but it also becomes the key to becoming a good ruler or a good mm -hmm. guard, right? A good guardian. Uh, and so there's a teleological dimension, but there's also a holistic dimension. Kind mm -hmm. of like the, yeah. and the analogy, so you did well in bring the form of the good, but and the analogy uh, mm -hmm. is 
in ontological matters, the form of the good subordinates the action of all the forms insofar as all the forms are teleologically defined as that toward which every particular that participates in the form tends in the limit. So, mm-hmm. so, so uh, wisdom is the virtue that subordinates all the subordinate virtues insofar as it specifies the consummation for all of the possible activities that occur in the Kalipolis. So mm-hmm. every, so there's a, a concrete coordination there that is, I think, irrefutable once you look at it, right? No, yeah, I, I think, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, and yeah, I think that helps, helps sort of explain what I think is this really interesting juxtaposition there, the sort of like what the egalitarian thrust in Plato is even. Indeed. Right. Indeed. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't stay on it. And no, and that's no, but that's that's something that I also will be talking about very strongly, which is how is this Kalipolis philosopher, king, guardian, whatever you want to call you know, the, the, the archon, the philosopher mm-hmm. archon, uh, how are we to understand this political system? People say, well, you know, he was really an aristocrat, he was a totalitarian popper, right? Uh, he was a communist, you know, an egalitarian, you know. Um, what was actually, what could we call Plato's system? Now, spoiler alert, I think that the best you can do is call it an enlightened meritocracy. I think that's the best way. I don't think he was an aristocrat because aristocracy didn't, well, it is yeah. in, a, in a different sense, but we'll get to that. Uh, Elara, you have uh, your hand up. Oh, wait, could I just, I oh, sorry. Two, right. two points. That, yeah, I guess I would call it the rule of the better reason, right? And leave it at that. Uh, and then I just, on your earlier point, then I think excellence is a much better translation than virtue, probably. <laughs> it, it could be, it could be, but I think, I think the, the thing about virtue is that it defines uh, some, you're right, because I it mean, just comes from the Latin, Latin for masculine, right, is for, right. for like spirit and yeah. Yeah, and it, it does actually uh, capture the, I mean, because the problem is more, uh, virtue is moralistically, uh, you know, it, drenched at this point in history whereas uh, with excellence we just get this idea of something realizing its proper function right mm-hmm. something real and i think actually uh, this this sense is retrieved by mcintyre obviously of this original sense of virtue as related to mm-hmm. excellence and craft uh, and after virtue of course right mm-hmm. um, uh, you were showing like the vision of the the next slide, right? Uh, and you yes. talked a little bit, oh, I didn't cover the aesthetic, but I was like wondering if you have like an indication of uh, any book on uh, the idea of the aesthetic uh, for Plato, because when we approach him from art, we usually say, well, he was like, we go from some sections of the Republic and say that uh, how Plato relates to aesthetics is very naive and uh, it's all, almost always this sort of perception as a reductive or um, restraining approach. And I know that Plato has like a healthier relationship with music and ontology on music. And there are like interesting works on that, but I was wondering like for more visual arts or something of the sort, if you have an idea of books or anyone that covers this. I, I do, and I will send, uh, I um, just, can you shoot me an email so that I can send you some references concretely through email and anybody else who's interested in any kind of bibliographical editions, uh, uh, um, I, I can send them, but to speak conceptually, right? So everybody's sort of familiar with, you know, what Plato says, you know, the quarrel with the poets, um, you know, his love for music. Uh, and there's some, but there's something quite interesting, I think, that we're going to see when we get to the Phaedo. And this, this might be something that is worth meditating about, which is that when um, Socrates' friends arrive to the prison to, to, to spend time with Socrates before the time of, of, of departure, they find Socrates, uh, Socrates tells them that he's been engaged in writing uh, poems and, and music. Uh, and that he, there, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see like right in the brink of death, he had a dream, he had apparently a dream that told him, you know, Socrates, you should do this, maybe, as if maybe this was something that he had underappreciated or underemphasized in his life. But we know, of course, that even though there is a kind of polluting element to the artist, right, specifically the poet uh, in, 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 in the construction of the Kalipolis, it's also an inherent part of the education of the city. As we know, it begins 
the beginning of the educate of the pedagogical program that we get in the Republic begins with a training in music and poetry, right? In addition to you know basic arithmetic or mathematics, right? And then you you move to other latitudes. But in the question of visual arts, right? It's very difficult to find anything extraordinarily uh, categorical in there. One would like to say, or one would usually say, that to the extent that Plato derides the ontological and epistemological uh, relationship to images, right, um, insofar as they adorn the visible, that he would think very little of, in fact, uh, visual arts, right? But I'm not sure that this is the case. I'm, I think that's too simplistic. Do I have anything terribly eloquent to say about that? No. But I do think that just saying that he would deride images as a whole or any kind of visual experience is flies in the face of what we also know about what Plato says about the his aesthetic ideals concerning the beauty of bodies, for example, and the contemplation of beauty. Of course, he has very classical Greek sort of conceptions of what beauty is bound to, you know, principles of proportionality, harmony, and so on. Again, understanding everything in kind of uh, this kind of mathematical way. So one can obviously be critical of his particular aesthetic paradigms, but this at least indicates that there is a relationship to artistic production and even to images that is not necessarily, or at least in principle, discarded, right? Um, but I don't have anything on top of me to say like right now. And again, this is one of those things that I'm still trying to figure out. The other thing, um, other than you know his writing some poetics that I would point attention to, is I think that the dialogue that I mentioned before, the Eon, where he has a debate that also shows uh, a much more complicated relationship to poetics and to poetry and to the act of hermeneutics, to the act of interpreting poetry. And so to the extent that artistic experience is not just bound to artistic production, but interpretation and what is artistic interpretation, I think there we get uh, Plato engaged in a kind of magnificent uh, uh, exercise of assault against the rhapsodes, who are, of course, the covert friends of the sophists. And then, of course, the other place that I think is also helpful for this is the Cratylus, where we see Socrates, the etymologist. And in doing so, in this etymological interpretational study of the meaning of words and trying to, you know, there's a long discussion there about what language functions as, right? What, what's the function of names? Uh, in the Cratylus, there is this kind of like excursus through literary analysis for the purposes of arriving at a clarification of the nature of names. So this means that even, uh, you know, interpretation literary interpretation and etymology, genealogical etymology, can be key towards clarifying the nature of the forms. And so this maybe goes back to what we were uh, interrogated, what Enda interrogated concerning the role of hermeneutics uh, and how we would you know, position a method like that of Gadamer or Heidegger in the context of Plato's, uh, you know, the Socratic method. Uh, so I think you see, it's like, it's much more complicated than people think. And those dialogues are oftentimes not centrally uh, paid attention to, especially the Eon and the Cratylus in that, in that way. I would love to see somebody write something about like, uh, you know, Heidegger and or Gadamer and the Cratylus. That would be fantastic. And entomology, that would be fantastic. Oh, we have 10 minutes left. Yeah. So uh, hold on. Let me, I'm going to stop. Let me just show you where we're going. I, I, I completely anticipated we we're going to run out of time because I had a million things to show. Uh, and it's fine because uh, next week we have very little like reading so I was like thinking we were going to do this so let me just show you what's coming uh, from from today so that you have an idea we're going to briefly rehearse a history of Platonism um, throughout from all the way from antiquity to today and there's and then I'm going to just briefly talk about the friends and enemies of Socrates in the 21st century um, and the resurgence of Platonism and then we're going to look at the uh, question of re the Republic, the divided line, and the question of mathematics and dialectics, and the training for the political uh, train, uh, for, for, for the political construction of the polis. And I also have a, a, a rather technical aspect or exposition about the dialectical organization of the forms uh, in its relationship to semantic and epistemological sort of considerations that we're going to look at. Um, 
So this is just a preview of coming attractions since we stayed in very uh, high, high grounds now. I just want to show you some of the things that we're gonna be looking at in more substantive detail. Um, one of the things that next week we're gonna be looking at to, to, to set us off, right, with the with Republic Seven is this business of the transition from mathematics as analytical ideologies, as what you call them, or hypothetical principles, to the dialectic as a hypothetical principles or first principles, and how this allows us to understand the dialectical relationship between the forms themselves in a kind of semantic and ontological and epistemological holism that eventually corresponds to a holistic pedagogical plan for the Kalipolis that articulates, of course, both theoretical education, but also political education, right? The education of warfare, the education of politics that takes you know, five years at the end of the journey. Um, but one thing, so there is, as usual, um, what, what I like to do is rather than take, because there's 20 people in class, and if we take you know, presentations, it's gonna take up like way too much time. So usually what I will do, what we'll do is upload a OneDrive file for those of you where, where it's gonna be divided by the uh, readings, right? The mandatory readings. And you can sign up your names for uh, what you wanna present for. And rather than presenting during the sessions, what you will do is a recording, uh, record the presentations and submit them. Because it turns out that in my experience, you know, uh, we just run out of time if, if, if we just, just do it and, and we won't able to get uh, to where we need to do it. Um, and then the other thing is there's a paper um, do at the end of the class, of course, at the in, uh, two weeks after, um, two weeks after uh, the the last day of class, the paper essentially can be on any of the topics that we've covered, uh, anything that you might find interesting yourselves concerning Plato, Platonism, it, its effects. You can branch out and talk about something else altogether that is related, but uh, it's, it's tangential. I'm happy to that to do that. If you want to discuss papers with me, I'm also happy with that. I'm available. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? Uh, anybody wants to throw in? Uh, will we discuss the uh, el the allegory of the cave later or not? We will. That yeah. will be the begin. So uh, next time after this kind of like quick uh, run over um, the history of Platonism. Uh, because there's there's a few details there that I'm going to really uh, that I think are I hadn't realized this, but I'm really specifically looking forward to telling you guys about what I found out when I was reading Neoplatonism, and specifically when I got to Plotinus and Proclus, and understanding what Proclus, who is the greatest comment, you know, who has produced the greatest commentary in my opinion of Plato of all time, uh, his commentary on the dialogues. I really recommend that you guys. Uh, uh, I'm actually going to get those and I'm going to upload them to the readings folder as well for those of you who want to take a look. But it's not only, they, they serve as anticipations, not only for uh, Spinoza's ethics later, so that you can understand the influence of Neoplatonism and the ethics, but it's also, I think, the key to understand how it is that today um, these new dialectical materialists are looking to. Uh, revitalize Plato as a materialist thinker of multiplicity. And in looking at Proclus briefly, just I have one thing to show you about Proclus is going to illuminate that, that point very clearly. Uh, Raviv? I just had a question about the, so the readings. So, um, um. Our, so our next week, for instance, like the presentations on the week one readings going to be submitted. And, yeah, and you, so as in like this following week is the week one reading period or we were. Oh, like so, I, I, was, I was unclear whether we were supposed to read that for this class or for. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, so so the, so ho hopefully everybody at this point has read the Republic seven. Um, because I've been referencing to the divided line and making references to to to, to this you know, organization of you know the, the the forms in relation to the form of the good and so on. But we'll 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 do a closer reading, of course, of that also in conversation with the Badu next next week. In addition to the first of the central dialogues that we're talking, which is the youth of world. So oh, I yeah. because I expected today to 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 take most of the time in introductory materials. Um, I, I realize we're not going to 
Finnish, you know, uh, Republic. So we're next week, we only have the youth of row. And then the Minos are recommended reading, but you know, for those of you okay. who don't, uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, the Republic, but sorry, in, in the topic of presentations, you can submit the presentations if you want to present on the materials that are scheduled for week one, so on Republic 7 or Baju or the Heidegger or whatever, right? All of the presentations will be or are to be submitted at the end of the class, at the, uh -oh. end, of, at the end of the seminar, I mean, sorry. So you don't have to, you know, those of you who want to present on next week's stuff or this week's stuff, you don't have to submit your presentation by the oh, end right. of the week. Got it, got it. All of you have the, the opportunity to submit. That's how I like to do it at least. Uh, because that also gives you more time to 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 go through the seminar before you have to produce something, which I don't I don't think makes much sense, right? Like week two, let's start like talking about this, right? Um, cool. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, anything? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions, thoughts? Okay, so then um, again, next time we're going to begin, uh, please, uh, if you're sticking with the seminar, ne next seminar is going to be very important because I'm going to explain the, the formal dimensions of the theory of forms, uh, as I mentioned, and that's, that's very central to understand what's coming next, and to understand this kind of the articulation of mathematics and dialectics, which I think is the key of what I wanted to get to with Republic 7. Um, because that, that is sort of presupposed, I think, already in the late days of Socrates. You can't understand what is happening in the Phaedo and you know, elsewhere without that, okay? Um, all right, so I guess that's that for today. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry if I, we didn't get to the, to the deep text, but we will next time, we will start right there. So pleasure meeting everybody and shall see you next week. Thank you, Daniel. Muchas gracias. Gracias.